fans, welcome to this video. Uh, we will look at the game between Gary Kasparov and Jeroen Piquet, played in Zurich 2001. And we will learn a lot about positional chess and knights in this game. So let's get right into it. Gary Kasparov with white played e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, knight c3, sort of a closed um, Sicilian, um, e5, bishop c4, bishop e7, uh, d3 and d6. Now, if you want, um, pause your video for the first training question. Um, already this much in the opening. Um, what is the positional weakness in black's position? And also, does white have a positional weakness as well? Or is it only black? If you want, pause your video and try to try to find black's positional weakness. Okay. Black has a hole in his position here on d5. Hole means that if I place a piece on this uh, square here, it can never be pushed away with pawns. So for example, if this knight moves here, it can only be attacked by, for example, another knight or a bishop. But it can never be attacked by a pawn because both of those pawns are already advanced. And on the other hand, this square here uh, looks a bit similar, but it is actually not a positional weakness as compared to the d5 because if the knight jumps in here, for example, we still have this pawn. And this pawn can move forward and control this square. Okay, so Gary Kasparov now played. Well, first of all, what would you play in this position? Why to move? Um, a lot of us would think of like developing the bishop somehow. Um, maybe developing the pieces like this, or maybe castling, right? Probably most people would castle. But Gary played the move knight to d2. Okay, now, next question of this video. What is the purpose of this move? Moving the knight that has already moved, moving that knight again before castling. So, what is the purpose behind this move and why did white not castle? Okay, white's idea is to take advantage of this position of weakness. And white's plan is to reroute the knight to e3 so that both knights here, together with the bishop, um, can co take control of the positional weakness, the d5 square. And why does white not castle? Okay, if white castle, um, white would need 1, 2, and then the rook would be blocking the square. So the rook has to move to the side 3, Four, five moves. And with the king still here in this square three, white would only need one, two, three moves. Okay, so white actually saves a move by playing knight to d2. And it helps white that black cannot exploit um, in any way any disharmony in white's camp because. There's not really a move that would try to exploit this. Okay, so black played knight f6. He played knight f1, and the idea is to play knight e3 and then castle. Again, saving a move. And now black tries to somehow punish uh, what white is doing and plays knight to a5, attempting to exchange this knight for the bishop and taking advantage of the fact that white has lost some time. But Kasparov simply played knight e3, and black said, okay, I'm happy to get a bishop for a knight. The bishop is oftentimes a little bit more valuable than the knight. Okay, in this position, 
should white retake with the knight or with the pawn? Okay, Kasparov retook with the pawn. And there are two reasons for this. First, it simply opens up the fire. And this pawn here be becomes weak, becomes very weak, because now it's, it's an open file and it's backward. White does ruin his pawn structure a little bit, but this pawn actually here is also quite strong because it blocks black from getting any counterplay with playing b5. For example, if I took with the knight, black can immediately, well, not immediately, but black can uh, push his pawn and then um, play against these knights who would be a little bit badly positioned. And taking with the pawn also solidifies control of the d5 square. Okay, so black continued development with castle and now white played queen f3. Now what is the purpose behind this move? Why did white not now play any of the knights to d5? Why did white play queen f3? Okay, the reason why white didn't play any of the knights here is because he can wait, he doesn't need to rush. Um, white could play the knight here, knight takes, knight takes, and white would have a nice knight. But what else would, would uh, white have? At the moment white doesn't have any other advantage. So black has time to play bishop um, to e6 and then exchange this knight. And after these pieces have been exchanged, white does not have any advantage. So after white has um, highlighted this position of weakness and positioned his knights optimally to take advantage of this, white is now looking in this position here for other resources um, that he can create in the position. And Gary played queen f3 with the idea of castling longside and then getting some attack on the king. And then maybe bringing the knights in here and suddenly having two resources, attack on the king and a knight on b5 um, on this very strong outpost. Okay, so if you have one resource and you can keep it in the position, before exploiting that resource, try creating other resources as well. Okay, black gets a little bit jittery and plays g6. And do you think this is a good defensive move? Um, the idea that takes control of these squares. But do you think it's a good defensive move? Okay. This move does take some squares, but it's actually a bad move because it creates holes in black's positions. And if you are defending, or if white has potentially some attack, the best idea is often to leave the pawns exactly where they are, because this way you are most flexible in advancing one pawn or advancing the other. After you play g6, you cannot really so well advance this pawn anymore. Maybe in this position, if you were black, a better idea would be to create some to create some counterplay. To, while white attacks on this side, you maybe attack on this side. And don't forget, white has not castled yet. Okay. And now Kasparov played immediately g4. Now, why is this move a good attacking move if the opponent has played g6? In the particular case of g6, why is g4 a good attacking move against g6? Okay, the reason is that white wants, actually white wants to play against this pawn by pushing his h-pawn forward and using it as a lever against the g6 pawn. Because if this pawn moves forward, white either in the next move takes this pawn and opens up this file, 
which is making it possible for white to attack on this open file because the rook is ready to attack. Or, alternatively, the pawn takes, but then we can retake with the, with the piece or with the, uh, the queen or the rook, and we have also opened up the file. Or, black has to move this pawn forward once this pawn has advanced. Um, but this weakens the position as well, suddenly this square becomes weak, especially when there's a knight. Or, if white now played h4, black has the defensive resource of playing h5, denying this pawn to move forward. Excuse me. This pawn is blocking the h-pawn moving forward. And that's why in this position g4 is a very strong move against g6, because it takes away the only or the most effective defensive resource that black has in this position, which is to play h5 or knight h5. Both moves attempt to attempt to block this pawn. And by playing g5, g4, and this is a very common theme, if your opponent plays g6, g4 takes away this resource. And white still plans to play h4, h5 in the next move, but g4 is preparing this. Okay, so um, black played um, bishop to e6, developing, and now white continues with its plan, playing h4. The sprout is not wasting any time, the king is still in the middle, but because of this pawn structure, he's not afraid of black opening the position anytime soon. Again, black should have played maybe moves like this to open up the position, to get some counterplay. Okay, black played queen d7, putting a little bit of pressure on this pawn. And Kasparov played rook to g1. Notice that white now has created a second resource. White still has this square and this hole with both knights ready to jump in. But as compared to the position before, white has now in the last moves created another resource which is an attack on the black king. Okay, and black gets nervous and focuses, instead of getting counterplay, focuses on the best defensive setup. And maybe it should be said, um, at, the, at this time in 2001, Gary Kasparov and um, Jérôme Piquet have already played like seven, eight games. And I think Kasparov won all of the games. There was one draw, otherwise Kasparov has won all games. So this might maybe also explain a little bit why black was playing g6. And now black has nothing, has no better idea than playing uh, king h8 because black is just afraid. Um, black plans to move the rooks over and get all the pieces over here to defend. Um, but again, black should get some counterplay himself because um, otherwise he's just doomed to a passive position. Okay, white plays a4 in this position. Okay, look at this. White has this kingside attack, white has this uh, hole here. And now white plays a4. Why? Why does white play this move? Why does not why does white not continue his pawn push? Okay, this is really what makes a strong grandmaster like Gary Kasparov. White is not continuing his pawn push for the same reason that in this position he was not placing a knight here on this square. The reason is because he can. <laughs> um, in this position here, um, in this position here, white can play a4 because he can. This move keeps the kingside attack in the position. It also keeps the hole with the knights in the position. All of this doesn't run away but what white does with this move is preventing any counterplay. Again, black could have counterplay by playing a6, b5. This is the only plan, the only lever that black has in this position. This pawn here is very strong and controlling anybody coming in on this side. But after playing a4, there's really, it's not possible 
to make this pawn break anymore. There's no way that black now can do anything. If black played a5, he would get control of this square, but which piece is going to exploit this? And there's also this pawn which can move forward. Okay, so a4, very strong move and very, I don't know, very um, also a move that is very instructive because, let's be honest, who of us in this position would not place the knight here or continue with the with the push? It takes a lot of coolness and we can learn from this to play a4 and say, okay, my position is strong, but I'm going to prevent any counterflow. Okay, black tries to continue rearranging all his pieces to the defense. And white now plays b3, same idea, attempting to put the bishop on this diagonal. The bishop here is the only piece that is not yet so well placed. And white has all the time to improve. Rook brings over, just, just brings over pieces to the defense. Yeah, and now in this position, um, very interestingly, um, black doesn't have any space. White has a lot more space. White has a space advantage. And what? does that mean? Space advantage means that black really has trouble rearranging his pieces. So for example, if this knight wanted to somehow move over here, it's 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 very pos it's it's very hard to do. Or for example, if this bishop wanted to participate somehow on this side of the board, it's very hard. Or this queen. If the queen wants to move over here without any space it's it's very hard. On the other hand, with a lot of space, it's very it's very easy. There's a lot of space for the white pieces to move around. And so in a position like this, um, black often can do only things like moving this rook back, and then white does something, white castles, develops, and then moving the rook back. Black can cannot do anything in this position. So in this particular position here, black chose to play h5. To activate his pieces. The idea is that white obviously has his kingside attack and maybe wants to open the files, but this opens up some um, some opportunities for black as well. Okay, so in this position, um, white does have, as we have seen, white does have the opportunity to open files, but what should white play there's an even stronger move can you find an even stronger move than opening up the files against the king what move should white play okay kasparov played g5 super interesting um kasparov is excuse me kasparov is um Playing this pawn push, but then when the opponent gives him the opportunity to open up the position, he plays g5. And um, the idea is that, um, well, after knight to um, g4, white can play knight g4 takes, and after bishop takes, um, queen e3. Um, is a similar position. White will play um, f3 and push this um, bishop away and then we have a little bit of a similar position then in the game. Um, but black wants to keep the knight and puts it to h7 and in any way g5, the idea behind g5 is that white now makes advantage of the other resource that he has. This position of weakness here on d5 is at the moment protected by the knight. And after g5, knight h7, there's nobody to protect this weakness here. And that's why Kasparov chooses to close the position and also cementing his base advantage. Now this knight cannot move, this bishop is blocked, the rooks are very passive, um, the queen and the bishop also look very sad even though they might be the only ones who have some opportunities but you know where can this bishop go is it, if it goes here it will just as we have seen in the variation before taken by the knight the queen steps aside and then f3 and then this bishop also doesn't have any space to go okay so after this move Kasparov played queen to g3 
And what's the idea behind this move? What does this move even do? Okay, very interesting. This is a prophylactic move. And if you are wide to play in this position, imagine this is one of your games. Um, you could focus now on your plans. You could focus on your plans and maybe castle and say, okay, I want to double my rooks on this file here to play against the weakness. You could maybe say, okay, I want to bring my knights here. You could focus on your plans. But what Kasparov does is he focuses on the opponent's plans. So in this position here, imagine you're black. Yeah. Imagine you're black. You have just moved your knight here to the corner. So what is your plan? You're revealing your plan by playing your knight here. The knight didn't go here, but the knight went here. And this is really a bad square, unless Unless what? Unless I'm planning to push forward this pawn. And again, black is cramped. Black tries to open up his position. Black has revealed this intent by playing h5 earlier. And this pawn he has moved forward. And now black has revealed again this intent by playing the knight back here. So Kasparov realizes and this is something you can also um, you can also you know adopt for your playing style. He uh, he he anticipates that Black wants to play f6, which is actually um, very clear if you think about it. Um, that this has to be Black's plan to uncramp his position, and that's why he plays Queen g3 because the idea is that after f6 he wants to play f4. And we can see what happens because this is exactly what happened in the game. Black plays f6, it's the only active plan, and white, because played queen g3, now has the resource f4. Um, and the idea is that black never wants to take here because it opens up this diagonal against the king. This pawn has to stay here. And so the only way that white can continue is to either take here or to move the pawn forward, but moving the pawn forward um, doesn't really achieve much. If black takes here, this will activate this knight, so white could just castle and put pressure on the d6 pawn. So in the um, in the game, black played g takes f, and white played f takes g, and so by playing the move queen to g3. Let's imagine white would have castled f6. Then in this position, um, white would probably have to take, which would allow black to activate his pieces. Um, if white does not take, but for example, um, I don't know, now plays queen g3, then after f takes, um, yeah, white has already a little bit of trouble here. So that's why that's why um, queen to g3 is such a strong move. Okay, f6, f4, f takes, f takes, and again, now really there's no more lever, no more pawn break. The knight is forever bad and the bishop is also forever bad and white still has a lot of space. Okay, now in this position, Black really cannot do anything anymore. Black played rook g7, attempting to double the rook c on this file, and now white starts to take advantage of his assets. White has strengthened his position, and white now can play against this weakness, against this weakness potentially, and exploiting the position of um, a hole here on d5 as well. So black played a6, there's not much really that black can do. And now finally the knight jumps in. Um, the bishop drops back. And white is attempting to double rooks on the d5. Queen f7. And now very interestingly, white does not play immediately. 
uh, rook d1, doubling the rook here, but plays first rook f1. The idea is obviously that the queen cannot take because then uh, black would lose uh, the queen for just a knight and a rook. So the queen has to move again. And now, now um, white could play rook d1, doubling the rooks, and this would be a good move. But white plays knight f6. Okay, let's have a look. This looks a bit counterintuitive. This knight is blocked in here. And why would I play knight f6, offering to exchange this knight? So, why does white play this move? What happens if pieces now get exchanged on f6? In the game, black played queen c6, so why did black not play knight takes? Okay, we can, we can find out by just calculating this line. Knight takes, f takes, bishop takes. Um, white now is a pawn down, and black has gotten rid of this knight. So what's to like about white's position? Well, it's very simple, because, well, in fact, um, Uh, but it doesn't matter really if black takes, rook takes, or bishop takes. Um, in this case, even more pieces get exchanged, so this might be even better for black. Um, so, but in this position, um, white first wins back a pawn, but the most important feature is of this exchange that both of these pawns are now weak. And as we will see, queen e7, attack with the rook, bishop takes, now white is a pawn up because these two pawns are very weak. Bishop takes, queen takes, and you can see how well white's pieces coordinate and how bad black's piece, pieces coordinate. Um, the queen and the rook are threatening to take the bishop, but um, and the rook is blocked, it's pinned against the king. Um, if the bishop moves, um, we can exchange, and then this pawn is weak, this pawn is weak, this pawn is weak, so uh, white is a pawn up and has much more active pieces. That's the reason why black does not exchange this knight. And it's so interesting because psychologically, in this position here, black plays h5, having in mind this kingside attack and you know putting the rooks, putting so many moves and time to put these rooks. And white could open up the position here both opening up the position and what Kasparov played in the game are good ideas and good moves, but Kasparov just loves to play g5, um, playing what the opponent does not ex expect, but what is still a good move. And in a similar way, um, in this position here, black wants to reroute his bishop, and now white plays knight f6. Uh, sorry. <laughs> In this position here, white plays knight f6. So black must have, for the last few moves, I mean, after g5, the knight here was really lost. And um, already here, the knight, well, here white played g5 and the knight dropped back. From this move onwards, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. For seven moves, or for six, seven moves, black must have hated this knight and always wondered how can I free up this knight. And now Kasparov plays knight f6, offering to exchange the knight, almost with the purpose of teasing black. And of course it's a good move, because tactically, as we have seen, it gives white a winning position, but um, it's, it must, it, it's, must be such a huge psychological pressure to be black here. Um, because it's almost as if white is mocking you, um, offering to exchange this bad knight, and then you calculate the line and you find out it doesn't work. It's very interesting also from the psychological side, these type of moves. Okay, black probably thought here, do I exchange, do I get rid of my knight, and must have been very bitter about playing queen c6. And now uh, 
Kasparov just takes advantage of all the positional advantages he has in the position and just plays against his weakness. Bishop c7 covering the weakness and the knight drops back uh, as if the knight only had the purpose to tease the knight here over here. <laughs> um, it has done and fulfilled his um, psychological purpose and goes back. Um, attempting now to excuse me, attempting now to exchange his bishop um, and get this pawn. That's why um, the bishop drops back. And now another humiliating move. A5. What's the purpose behind this move? Okay, the purpose behind this move is simply that white even ties down black further. Black now can never play d6 anymore. Together with this knight and this pawn, black gets, gets tied down more and more. So what can black play here? Not much. Um, I mean, look at these pieces. It's, it's just everything is just so bad. And white's pieces coordinate so well. This bishop on the diagonal potentially. The knights with the strong. The rook battery against his weakness. The queen um, ready to jump into a lot of uh, places. Um, the pawns very healthy. So yeah, it's white's position is just so amazing. Okay, the black has nothing better to play than. Uh, King g8. By the way, doubling the rook here um, would have been an option. Um, not sure how white can punish this. Um, white would probably want to um, make sure the rooks cannot invade here. And now king g7 might have been an option. Not sure. Um, so white played king g8. And white just um, so black played king g8, and white just plays bishop c3 with the goal of bringing his king over, slowly improving his uh, pieces. Now black doubles rook, so this certainly is a plan. But white doesn't even care if the rook can invade here and plays king d2. And um, yeah, can black now invade the position? Um, in fact, that's what happened in the game. But is it a good move? Well, let's have a look at the game. Uh, Gerrard and Piquet, after a whole game of pain, played this move and lost. <laughs> because knight e7 attacks the king and the queen, and black loses the queen. A super big, a super uh, strong GM in this position blunders his queen. Interesting. So that's probably the point from the very beginning um, that after King G8, Kasparov was just waiting for Black to double his rooks and come in here because he knew he has the resource Knight E7. But okay, let's pause a little bit for the last question in this video. What can black actually play? I mean, if not rook to f2, which blunders the queen, what can black play? Okay, I have said that all the white pieces are coordinating really well, and that black's pieces are either passive or not coordinating. And this is a sort of position where tactics work, okay? so. If you have reached a position like this, you should always start looking for tactics because if your pieces are better and the opponent's pieces are uncoordinated, it's oftentimes the case that tactics work. So to illustrate this, um, if black plays king g7, if you want, it's a little bit hard to see, but if you want, try to find how white can now simply win the game. Okay, white can win with knight c7, looks crazy, right? But bishop takes, why not? Rook takes, attacking the queen, bishop takes, rook takes, attacking the queen again, queen takes, now double attack on king and queen. Black has nothing better than giving up the queen. Check and attacking the bishop, so if the king moves away, we win the bishop. And now we have... Um, 
7 pawns against 5 pawns and knight against knight and queen against 2 rooks. So 2 rooks are a little bit stronger than the queen, but we are also um, 2 pawns up. So the material is a little bit even in white's favor. But in addition to this, white also has very active pieces and can attack all the weaknesses in black's position. This knight still is bad, this rook at the moment is pinned, so um, white is simply winning in this position. So after this sequence, after king g7, um, and this sequence, um, white can simply exchange into a one position. For example, um, the game could continue, check, check, could continue like this, and now um, Black just died. Okay, um, what else? Maybe, um, yeah, it's so sad because um, if Rook want, if the Rook wants to invade here, um, but White has the resource of the double attack on the King and Queen, maybe White would want to prepare this a little bit. But look, White would need to prepare this by moving the Queen away. Where can the Queen move? The Queen cannot move. Can I move here? Can I move here? Can I move here? Cannot move here. So um, maybe the queen moves here. But the problem is um, obviously that um, if the rook now were to move again and move here, we still have this fork. So the queen has to move here. Um, but in this position, um, the queen is not really more active. Um, on e8 than it has been on e6 and um, I'm not sure I haven't checked this before but now um, probably going um, or maybe in this position um, controlling the, the entry point well I haven't checked this before but um, with these active pieces, usually a lot of the tactics work. Um, and um, white simply has to, has to uh, whatever black moves, it's very hard to find a move for black and white can either continue to, um, to improve his position or start playing against the weaknesses or looking for tactical blows like the knights to c7. The most important feature in this position probably is also the psychological factor. White can put a lot of threats, um, a lot of tactics, whereas black really has to has to make sure he doesn't he doesn't overlook anything. So we have seen king g7 makes a lot of sense to so somehow bring the king maybe a little bit closer, runs into the tactics that we have seen. Um, so psychologically, it's very hard for black to find moves, and um, even a strong grandmaster would be tempted to play rook to f2 and simply blunder the queen because this is what happened in the game. Okay, so um, to quickly recap, white has the positional weakness here on the um, d5 square. Um, the rerouting of the knight, a very interesting resource to save time. But then also white didn't immediately use this resource but instead wanted to attack the king. And interesting, the resource g4 against the g6 pawn. Um, then in this position, after white has created the second resource king attack and the hole on d5, a4 to prevent any counterpoint play. Very interesting. Then um, in this position, um, well, of course, after h5, very interesting. g5 closing the position and pushing the knight away. And then the prophylactic move, queen g3, so that uh, we can answer f6, the only move in the black position, with f4. Um, then uh, the terribly teasing move, knight f6. <laughs> um, and uh, lastly, the totally tying down of black up until the final position. Um, also with this a5 move, really tying black down um, so that black cannot do anything anymore other than blundering his queen. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks a lot for watching. 
Uh, if you like this video, um, please don't forget to click subscribe so YouTube sends you an update once new videos become available. Thanks a lot for watching.